Yeah, retakes and salutations on your beautiful little earthlings. Welcome back. It's another repeat of League Unlocked. My name is Eric. I'll aboard the Millennium Falcon today for a little Han Solo epi. I'm sure you guys don't get tired of me saying that same intro about Han Solo. We're just shouting him out. And shout out to San Holo also if you've ever checked out his music. Great name, great tunes as well. But today is all about power rankings, domestic power rankings still feel like it's a little too early to dive into the global rankings because the LPL has basically only had two days of action so once things get rolling we get a week or two of games under the belt in China and even you know three plus weeks in the LCK then we could start looking at the big boys all collectively in that top 20 but for now we're breaking it up doing it domestically and we can get through the LCS in North America a whole lot quicker now because there's only eight teams that we gotta get through and only going off of two single games, two single best of one games. Obviously very difficult to even be ranking any of these squads, but I think you could have not played any games on the Rift and you knew that Immortals would probably be towards the bottom. And even though Dignitas picks up a win, they are one spot ahead of them in that seventh spot because they played head to head. And it still took 40-ish minutes, even though there were some good things to be excited about for Dig. I'm very excited to see the continued growth of XU um, on this squad going forward. Love a young domestic rookie to get hyped about, but these are still the two squads that you're least uh, excited, spiced up about going forward uh, in this split. Shopify Rebellion, 0-2, still ahead of Dig because, I mean, they had a semi-difficult schedule. Obviously, FlyQuest uh, is up there, and then they also lost to Team Liquid. But there were there were signs. Insanity's cooking with stuff like a Zac mid. Okay, Wild Turtle, even though he was a little too aggressive at times on the Lucian, he was looking peak performance at times. This guy, 10 years into his career, has still got it. I was still expecting B-Boy to even be starting heading into this first week, but it was obviously Wild Turtle uh, who was the guy who showed up and looked pretty good. So I'm not panicking for the 0-2 start uh, for Shopify, even though, again, remember, 14 games. That's all we're getting. 14 regular season games. It's still just a double round robin with only eight teams in the squad. So every week is incredibly important, but fully uh, am expecting the Rebellion, or the Rebels. Got to figure out what exactly they want us to be calling them uh, going forward. Team Liquid, team I just mentioned, a spot ahead of them because they won that head-to-head. -head. I, you know, Umpty looked good. Umpty looked like he had a control of the early game. Main concern for TL. Okay, Impact on this Udyr. Impact looking clean. Always does. Doesn't matter what team. We got to start talking about this guy as the best top laner in the history of the LCS. But the concerns... For TL, all the memes in the offseason, being a one-trick Ziggs and APA is still out here playing a Ziggs game in the first game of the regular season. Maybe that was just a statement out of him, but obviously a bit of concern if he actually can't be playing these incredibly meta champions. We got to see him play Azir on the other game of the weekend for Team Liquid, and truthfully, he didn't look super comfortable on that pick. Some of the Sharima shuffles were... Not at the level that we're accustomed to seeing out of other pro players. And I'm not even talking about the standout, insane Azir players like Baker or Humanoid in the LEC. Uh, just not as comfortable, which is crazy because Azir has been such a staple meta pick for so many years. So champion pool in the mid lane is the one thing I'm a little sus about for uh, Team Liquid. The bot lane core JJ and Yon looked pretty good this week probably should have been a 2-0 for TL truthfully but because 100 Thieves stole a win from them they're in that number four spot and what a fantastic debut for Mr. Sniper in the top lane imagine dropping the ribbon in your first ever LCS game it was a bit of a slow start but you saw the lethality and potential uh, on that pick when he was able to take over some of these team fights and obliterate that Ziggs out of APA and then he's playing Gwen in the second game so two for two when it comes to carries 
Very excited they didn't just immediately drop this dude on some tank duty because that is not what he is known for. They're showing that they're willing to play through and feature a rookie. And the other thing to highlight for me for 100 Thieves was Quid looked great in both of these games. The Yone, even though he didn't land some many huge ulties, the CSing, the lane phase, he was so unbelievably fed throughout this game. And most importantly, he was looking confident. He was a little bit timid at times last year with the 100 Thieves, which is more than understandable. One, not only are you a rookie, but you're coming over to an entirely new country and league to be playing. So very excited. 100 Thieves, this is the team that's got top three potential. I feel like if things really start clicking because the bot lane we haven't I mean, Meech, you know, he's played Seraphine in some of these games. We got we to gotta see what this rookie truly has to offer. River looked great as well. So I'm very excited to see the growth of 100 Thieves throughout this season. Energy is, you know, another difficult one to gauge, especially you, already got, you only got two games to be going off of, and one of them, they get dismantled by Cloud9. So it's hard where you stick these guys. Obviously, when you only have, when you have such a small sample size, you're taking in some of what it was last year especially when you have four fifths of the same roster so the defending champs deserve top three bare minimum after a one and one weekend uh, they got it done against dig in their second matchup and not much to go off of for them because again it's such a small sample size and can't crack into the top two because you had two four games of pure domination starting with fly quest in that two spot Mark and I touched on it briefly, but man, Whippo and Inspire looking like they haven't missed a beat. And most importantly, Jensen is looking and sounding, just hearing him talk about his team, more confident than he's been since Super Team Team Liquid many years ago because Inspired obviously was at an MVP level before he stepped away for a year. He seems reinvigorated, reignited on this FlyQuest roster and that mid-jungle duo that was some vintage Azir out of Jensen. APA didn't look comfortable. Jensen looked like it was 2017 and he's pulling out the Azir and dominating. He looked very good and much like uh, Meech on 100 Thieves, Masu is stuck on Senna duty for a little bit, but immediately next week, patches are gonna change or the patch note changes because we're playing on live in the LCS. So I'm excited to see uh, what other picks that rookie 80 carry can play and then cloud nine maybe you thought they'd have a slow start with this new roster but it wasn't the case whatsoever they already look a cut above everybody i'm already counting down the days uh, to see them match up against fly quest it's only two games so maybe we won't hand them the lcs trophy just yet but uh, jojo pion looked oh my god smooth criminal across blabber pick, picked up player of the week honors and I mean, we said this when it was initially rumored, but Blabber and Jojo has the potential to be the best domestic mid-jungle duo of all time in the LCS. And you can even include imports. This might be the best mid-jungle duo that North America ever sends out internationally. That's right, two games in and we're already talking about Cloud9 on the international stage. Week two action over in the LEC, which means we got a whopping six games now to start judging some of these squads, which should be enough for sweeping decisions on uh, statements and how the season's going to play out. And after 0-3, we weren't panicking because there were moments for K-Corp. At 0-6, the button has been smashed. The glass has been smashed. We are mashing the panic button because 0-6, I mean, even if you go 3-0 and in the final week, you are by no means guaranteed to be advancing. And really... Across the board, it's it's underwhelming. I mean, upset, maybe upset. It's years away now since we're talking about him as the best Western AD carry. Feel like he's playing too passive. He had a rough Aphelios performance where it seemed like he constantly had the wrong guns. Targamus is not on the same page with the rest of his team. Cabo Shard seems to be getting gapped in most matchups. Bo is really the only one playing at an LEC level over these last few games especially this week it was a step even below the 0-3 that we got from week one for K Corp so not the debut that you want to be seeing at all luckily for them maybe they could finish ninth because Rogue they get this win against G2 and then they look bad the rest of these they're so 
passive. Is It makes you kind of appreciate what Malrang was trying to do with this squad and just kind of be a psycho and be unbelievably, unbelievably aggressive because this team needs it. No one seems to be willing to step up to make some plays, which honestly, going back to even when Rogue was winning, this was the main knock on this squad. And years later, we're still talking about the same issues, dancing to the tune of one and five. And a lot of the games that they are losing, they're just kind of rolling over and getting stomped or just slowly bleeding out. We need to see some more life out of this squad. Even Giant X with a single win more than them, there's loads more Things you can feel good about and be positive about. Number one, first and foremost, Jackie's has been an absolute treat and a surprise in this stacked rookie pool. He's really standing out. Even in games where they're behind, he's the guy who's willing to make a play, even if it's a low percentage chance. That's what you have to do when you're behind. He's played with confidence. He's played, stepped well beyond just the Nico now, and he's stepped up against some of the best mid laners in the LEC, uh, that combined Patrick's playing at a pretty decent level. There's, I, I think we were still expecting more out of this XL core that made it so deep in the summer split, but there's there's much more positive signs out of Giant X than the bottom two squads in Rogue and K-Corp. Vitality, I would have been lumping in with that group, but they get a couple of games, a couple of wins this week. Hillisang on Senna, he must have been practicing with Reckless because that is the last pick I was expecting our boy Hillisang to look so good on, but they get the big upset against G2 uh, to, you know, climb up three spots in this week's power ranking. They looked real bad uh, at times in week, not at times, most of week one, but really solid bounce back from them to climb up and stay alive. Viteo has been good pretty much all six games. Uh, and now this week, it was definitely that bot lane. Karzi as well, alongside Hillisang, that Nyla Senna bot lane that we know Guma and Kyria have patented. Well, Vitality piloted it to pretty good success uh, in week two action. Mad Lions Koi, they dropped down a couple of spots. They're a difficult one uh, to grade. You know, they lost to a couple of good teams in G2 and BDS this week. Bounced back against a weak rogue squad. And what's amazing is... People flaming Carmine Corp and saying, man, these guys were just good in ERL, can't believe. People thought they were ready for the LEC. And then you look at Mad Lions, who is the main core of the Mavistar Riders, who K-Corp beat in the EU Masters Finals. So you can't have it both ways. Pick one, because Mad Lions are looking pretty damn good for four rookies, and they're mostly ERL players, and they're performing at the LEC level. So it's not a simple answer like that for K-Corp. There's a lot of issues going on there just ahead of Mad Lions Koi is Team Heretics despite losing getting completely smashed in that first game listen the two losses that Heretics have had have been real bad the G2 one was a pretty bad draft uh, but they got the win against SK which is enough to bump them up a spot and for the most part uh, again the four wins Heretics Almost only positive things to be talking about. It's just those two losses have been absolutely egregious. And the same could be said for G2 ahead of them because nobody in the league, and this is a tale maybe as old as time for G2, can look so good like the best team in EU by far on one day. And then you go to the very next one and they are getting beat by Rogue. They're getting smashed by Vitality and you're scratching your head. I mean, the Sona, Sona Seraphine lane that wasn't it for G2. They, they were trying to cook something up and that was just, that was bad. I, I've said this before with G2, it doesn't really matter this first round. You know that they're a best of team. They're gonna level up throughout the split, even though it's all five members returning. Uh, not concerned, but they have looked not good enough to be in top three because those two losses were so unbelievably bad, despite SK going 1-2 and two on the week after that 3-0 start. They drop a game to Heretics. They drop a game to BDS. But this team is still looking like a legit contender. Niski and Isma, the synergy is off the charts already. Irrelevant is quietly playing at an all-pro level. I mean, right now, after these two weeks, you're slotting them in. Top three top laners in the league, hands down, no question. And Lebrov is looking like... Uh, sorry, that's BDS getting too excited. Getting too excited, but Exekick and Doss have both looked uh, much more confident. Um, this split as well, much more 
like the winter and spring last year where SK was actually playing like some contenders. But despite having the head-to-head -head win against Fnatic, we bumped Fnatic into that two spot because they have looked so unbelievably dominant in uh, a few of their wins and humanoid right now. Best mid in EU. I'm going to say it. Through the first two weeks, he has been the best mid. He's playing the way now, popping off, which, uh, you know, I've seen him playing it in solo queue, and he's probably busting it out in scrims, but the first guy to really pull it out in the LEC, and he looks damn good on it. Him and Razork, the synergy off the charts, and now this week we started to see Noah and Jun kind of have an impact, and we talk about it all the time. If you're going to have a Korean import, 80 carries the spot to do it because you don't have to talk very much. And now he's paired with Jun, so it's almost like they're a, a two-piece little package together on their own to run around the map and dominate. And that is exactly what they've been doing. But the top spot belongs to BDS. Five wins in a row now, and they beat those two teams right below them, Fnatic and SK this week. Nuke has an incredible Nico performance. Not one, but two four-man ultis this week on the Nico. So he's the latest guy to step up this week. We've already seen uh, the bot lane playing at a high level. And now I can say Labrav is the best Blitzcrank in Europe. And it should be permabanned against them. Sheo playing at an all-pro level. BDS... Uh, the one swap is Ice coming in, and, you know, we heavily criticize it, but he has looked very good alongside LeBrov right now. Longest win streak in the LEC, best record, BDS deserving of the top spot two weeks into the split. LCK finally gets their time to shine, first week of action. Still, got to preface these, incredibly small sample size, only two single best of threes to go off of. Obviously, there's a handful of winless teams. If you throw in, okay, Savings Bank, Breon, they were not close in any of their matches. DRX was not very close in any of their matches, but the Kwangdong Freaks, I'm separating them a little bit. Number one, because they were actually competitive in their two series. And number two, those two series were against T1 and Hanwha Life. Far and away the most difficult schedule, not just of the bottom three, but probably of any team in the LCK to open the week up. So I'm expecting Kwangdong to still slide into that sixth spot, at the very least in the LCK, as things start to ramp up for them. But a very tough schedule in that first week. But they had gold leads against both T1 and Hanwha, so the proactiveness is there, ready for them to continue to grow. Firex ahead of them, one of many... Fear X with the Fox is still something I got, I got to get used to. But uh, Execute, hyped up rookie support. Looking pretty good. Had some smooth Nautilus engages uh, this week. A one and one start for Fear X. And obviously, you know, they matched up against the Bros, who, as I mentioned, did not look good. Got 2 0 by KT Rolster. Pretty much what you'd expect. Par for the course with those two matchups for them to go one and one. Nongshim is a bit of a surprise because. I think most people had DRX being better than them, and they end up 2-0 uh, DRX, especially after DRX was looking good in that first game. So Nongshi, a bit of a surprise 1-1, one one, but that's probably just because the expectations were so unbelievably low for this squad. The top five, it's not the Elite Four in the LCK anymore. It is the Elite Five, because there is such a massive gap between these five and the rest of the league. D-plus here at 1-1. One they lost that game two and three against KT Rolster, but I've already alluded to it. That was the highest quality game in any of the regions uh, this past week and this past year, which is one extra week of games. But even though they lost that series, I feel very good about Lucid and Showmaker. Kagan has been better than expected and aiming right back into that all pro level. So D plus, even in that five spot, they... Whew. If Lucid continues to advance and grow, then absolutely you should be scared of this squad. KT Rolster has really been better than expected, but then you look at this roster and you're like, well, yeah. I mean, but the surprise is that the top side has been the standout, and that is Piosic carrying over that world championship form. And then you got Mr. Perfect, Mr. Perfect T, who has the pop off in game three against Kingen, against D. If he can continue to play at a high level, then KT, no reason they can't be sticking around in that top three area. Humble Life had an easier week, but they absolutely dominated and blitzed both of those to the tune of two O's. So they're sitting pretty at a 4 0 overall record. And 
Peanut looks like he's fitting in nicely with the rest of his Gen G boys, Viper and Zeka. Finally getting a little bit of hype, uh, a little bit of help on the Rift. So, I mean, Hanwha in the four spot's insane. The, the fact that only four of these teams are going to go to the World Championship is an absolute travesty, as is often the case in the LCK and LPL. T1, they lose to Gen G. Still got to put them in that number two spot. I mean, some of this, again... They're the defending world champions, of course. It's a carryover, but because Gen G won that direct head-to-head -head and looked pretty damn good on it in the, the clinching game, you got to put them number one um, just because they beat them, you know? And that's such a small sample size. Keen has looked pretty damn good through the first five games for Gen G. Canyon has just been on Maokai duty, but did a pretty good job on it. Pays is pays. I mean, it feels like this roster has already played together for a long time, even though it's only been five games, two best of threes. But T1 bounced back in a big way against the Quang Gong Freaks, completely dismantled them in game two, bit of a cut, or game one, excuse me, and bit of a come from behind win in game two. Uh, but we're already seeing them throw up some spicy drafts, trying to find some action we've seen a, a brand jungle over in the lpl I'm, I'm waiting for a brand support maybe over for kyria but as the patches continue uh, to roll on this is this is just some mild cooking out of t1 you know things are going to level up and you know i can already tell you one weekend this is going to be an insanely contested top five in the LCK where I feel like anyone's gonna have the potential to beat anybody. The last few years, it feels like it's just been T1, Gen G, and then the rest of the league really feel like KT, Hanwha, and D Plus are all gonna be able to contest at the very top of the table, which means the level of the region should only be bumped up to an even higher level, which for the rest of the leagues across the globe is something that we should probably all be a little bit terrified about of our new overlords. Not new, our always overlords over in the LCK. But that is it today for League Unlock. My name is Eric. Thank you all you beautiful people for watching as always. And you best believe we'll catch you on that flippity flip.